I also want to let you know that this webinar will be recorded today. Um, it will go up on our YouTube page after the fact and will be available for you to view and share at that time. Um, you can find a link to that page and to all of our past webinar recordings also um, on the calendar page of our website. Again, that's tncoalition.org. If you scroll to the bottom of our webinar listing, you will see a link to, uh, to view past recordings and you'll be able to access past webinars and trainings that have been recorded at that, um, at that link. All right, to go ahead and get started, today we are talking about creating a trauma-informed um, physical and cultural environment within shelter. And so the two big pieces of that um, are, are really taking a moment to look at the impact that physical environment has on shelter residents and the way that they receive um, and respond to shelter services. And also hopefully give you all tools and ideas about um, evaluating and assessing and thinking about um, changes that can be made or should be made in the environment of, of your organization. So giving you some tools to think about how you can improve your organization's current environment. So the reason that we're talking about this and the reason that we have created um, a whole session of our shelter series webinars on environment is because the environment that we create for our residents, for our clients, communicates the beliefs that we have about them. So if we have um, a warm, inviting, safe, um, culturally respectful environment, then that communicates respect and care for those individuals that we serve. Creating a safe and welcoming physical environment should be one of the primary concerns of any trauma-informed victim services agency. Staff should consider the ways in which someone who's experienced trauma might receive the shelter services. Um, as we all know, abuse can really affect how a person feels about and interacts with the world. And so for programs who are serving survivors of domestic violence, it's vital to consider the physical environment that you're providing survivors to live in and interact with. with. Um, consider specific areas of the shelter, um, places like bathrooms and bedrooms, which are pri very private, personal spaces, which can be, um, can be particularly triggering spaces as well for survivors of violence. Um, if there is poor lighting in these areas, if there is a lack of privacy um, or a lack of control over their personal space in these areas, um, then it can be a much larger issue because of the individuals who are residing there and the things that they've experienced. So are we giving them, um, even if it's a shared bedroom space, are we creating it in such a way um, that they have their own personal areas and their own personal, um, you know, for instance, personal storage for their belongings, um, personal space, um, e even things like adding privacy screens can have a huge impact. Um, are the bathrooms individual bathrooms, are they multi-stall bathrooms? Are they sharing that private space with others and how is it arranged? And how is it set up to make sure individuals have privacy and security when they're in places that are, um, that they feel more vulnerable and that are more private spaces? Um, does the shelter have adequate building security? Um, is there out, adequate outdoor lighting? Um, is there adequate um, locks on the doors? Um, security around the building area? Does that feel safe when a survivor or when a resident comes in? So thinking about all of those things 
and how that affects the ways in which a survivor would feel coming into shelter and living in that, in that space. So some key pieces of a trauma-informed shelter environment. Staff are open and honest about the ways that shelter is difficult and are there to offer supportive strategies, right? Um, so when someone is coming into shelter, are we being open? Are we being clear about the ways in which, you know, Shelter is really difficult. Shelter is really challenging for a lot of people. And, you know, communal living in general is really challenging for a lot of people. And are we being open and are we being honest about that? And do we, um, have we identified strategies and support and the ways in which we are helping residents cope with those basic day-to-day -day difficulties? Um, do they feel like they can come to us and talk about communal living issues and those types of difficulties? So another thing is that the facility seeks to prevent or reduce re-traumatization by creating a physical and cultural atmosphere that is inviting. Um, so we are not having things like um, graphic posters about domestic violence. We are not um, having an atmosphere that is very clearly geared toward one group or one type of person. We have things in the environment that make it comfortable for individuals, that make it welcoming for children, um, that make it comfortable and accessible to individuals with very, very diverse needs and accommodations, right? Um, so we're thinking about the ways in which different people may experience the environment. Um, <clears throat> advocates should begin the process of evaluating the agency's physical space by thinking of times and spaces in which they have felt comfortable and welcome. So think about when you have been in an environment where you have felt welcome, where you have felt comfortable, where you have felt as if, um, as if this was a home away from home or as, as if this was a safe place for you. Um, and so what we want is we want to give survivors that same sense of welcome and that same feeling that the environment has been created in such a way to make it comfortable for them. Um, Think about the things that you do to make yourself comfortable when you're traveling or to make yourself comfortable when you're away from your home. Um, often we bring things like pictures in our wallets, we bring our phones, we play music that is familiar to us. We might bring a pillow or blanket um, from home that we need to sleep better. Um, we may bring food and snacks that we like. Um, in all of these ways, we are practicing self-care and we are practicing stress management in our travels. And the issue with shelter is that oftentimes survivors come into shelter in the midst of great stress, in the midst of great trauma and fear, and they don't have a lot of those, um, those stress management items, those comfort items that we would normally, in ideal situations, bring to care for ourselves. So providing a space that is physically safe, a space that is comfortable, a space that feels welcoming, is an important piece of providing them that comfort when they are not able to access it for themselves. Okay. So any comments or questions so far?
If you have questions throughout the webinar, please don't hesitate to take a moment to type those into your question or chat box and let me know if something doesn't make sense or if you have a question or concern and I will try to address that throughout the webinar this morning. All right, so thinking about physical space within the shelter. Um, we can create a comfortable, welcoming, calming environment in a lot of different ways. And this includes thinking about um, the art that's on the walls, thinking about the decor, thinking about the books that we have on our bookshelf. Um, you know, do the books reflect the cultures and the communities that we serve? Um, are we arranging the physical environment? Are we arranging the rooms to accommodate a range of interactions and behaviors? Um, are we creating quiet spaces as well as spaces for conversation and movement and for kids to play? Um, is the environment very noisy or very cluttered? Because this can be um, really unsettling to a lot of survivors. Um, consider the range of ways that you can use the space um, and how that can communicate that someone is welcome in the program. So do you have, um, even if you have just one big living room or, or common communal area in your shelter, how is that space arranged? We can still arrange that space to add you know, quieter areas or like maybe a reading nook in a corner versus areas that are surrounding the TV, which are more conversational, interactive spaces. Is it a comfortable space for children to be in? Um, what is that, you know, how are we arranging our space so that it has a variety of purposes and uses for people? Um, when we provide space for survivors to choose how to interact with the world, we're sending the message that we support survivors emotionally as well as physically. Um, this, the things that I'm talking about don't have to be a special burden or a, or a financial burden on shelters. A quiet space can be nothing more than, than a quiet corner of a larger room with a, you know, with a chair set back in it. Um, set aside for survivors to use to restore a feeling of calm. Creating this type of space can be as simple as a comfortable chair, uh, low lighting in that corner, a, you know, if it's part of a broader room, thinking about a privacy screen that can be opened or closed, um, a source of quiet music or sounds like a little fountain, um, shelters might choose to add plants or flowers, calming decorations, a soft blanket. Um, shelters may choose to have a space with supplies for writing or reading, um, a, a space for prayer and meditation, and these spaces can overlap. You don't have to have individual spaces for each of these things, but think about if you do set aside a quiet space, all of the things, all of the activities, all of the things that can be done in and with that space. Um, different things will be soothing to different people, so offering a small variety of, rate, of ways to utilize the quiet space can be helpful and impactful. So, a welcoming environment includes, but is not limited to, um, space for comfort and privacy, an absence of violence, violent or sexually explicit materials and posters, um, available and trained staff, staff that clearly explain and model safety and confidentiality, staff that give clear information and are consistent and predictable in their interactions with survivors. Staff that give survivors as much control over their experience and choices as possible. 
stuff who are encouraged to set boundaries and limits and ask for uh, accommodations as needed. Um, dedicated quiet spaces. Um, spaces for movement, whether that be inside or outside of the shelter. Um, areas for creativity like writing, art, or crafts. Um, quiet spaces for self-care or reflection. Decor that is welcoming and inclusive of diverse survivors, including those of different languages, faiths, and cultures. Books and reading materials, materials that reflect diverse interests and languages and readers. Um, spaces for children to play and interact, family-friendly spaces. Um, making sure that all spaces in the shelter are physically accessible to those individuals who have disabilities or mobility issues. Um, making sure your signs are clear and visible and in multiple languages. That you're not using signs and posters to convey uh, punitive messages like warnings or um, things about punishments or three strikes issues. Um, that safety warning signs are well made, easily visible, and understandable. Um, <clears throat> so all of those things. And also remember that shelter agencies are responsible for providing necessities to their residents without expectation of payment or contribution. Um, the necessities that you are responsible for providing include uh, food staples for basic meals and snacks throughout the day. Um, thinking about food, while it may be necessary to store bulk food in areas that residents don't have access to, so if you go to Sam's Club and you buy things in bulk and you have to store that in a separate closet, that's completely fine and understandable. But there should be a variety of basic food staples available to residents at all times. Agencies should be aware that many um, clients may have health or religion-related dietary needs. You know, some people cannot eat pork. Um, some people may be vegetarian or vegan. Some people may be lactose intolerant. Some people may have um, different diseases that they, you know, can't eat certain foods. So understanding that you may have to work to accommodate those. By providing a variety of staple foods such as meat, rice, beans, and canned vegetables, bread, milk, and eggs, agencies should be able to provide for the dietary needs of most residents. Um, the other category of necessities is toiletries and hygiene necessities. This includes menstrual hygiene products, shampoo, soap, deodorant, um, and other things that residents may need in the normal course of their personal care. Thinking about this also from a diversity standpoint and a cultural standpoint, Different individuals may need different types of toiletries. If you have um, a transgender individual, for instance, that um, that person may need different undergarments, may need a breast binder. Um, people of color, women of color, need very different hair care products and tools um, than white women, for example. So thinking about that, when you are gathering toiletries and hygiene products to store to, to provide to clients. Um, also clothing. Agencies should strive to keep on hand basic clothing staples in a variety of sizes and male and female styles. Um, so basic things like, you know, T-shirts, pants, undergarments in, in a variety of sizes for both male and female clients. Privacy is a necessary component of shelter services, um, particularly because the lives of the victims that we serve are often defined by a lack of privacy and a lack of control. So shelter residents are often seeking to be able to control the space that they're living in at a very basic level. Um, 
Shelter locations are treated with the utmost privacy as part of basic organization policy, but shelter sites, shelter, you know, physical shelter space, um, by its nature, is often frequented by a variety of people, including staff members, volunteers, interns, clients, children. So residents can really feel like they have no privacy at all when they're in shelter. Um, <clears throat> so we should really strive to give residents a feeling that they do have some privacy and that they do have some control um, over their personal space and the ability to personalize the space that they're living in. It's important to have public space as well as private. Communal spaces like the kitchen, living room, or areas used for smoking are places where clients interact and relationships are developed. But shelters should make sure that they have areas of privacy for counseling, for legal advocacy, for making personal phone calls. Um, clients must know that their personal spaces, such as their bedrooms, bathroom, their locked storage spaces, are treated with respect. Um, it's important to note that it is almost never acceptable to search clients' rooms, especially their personal belongings. Um, searches would only be permissible in the very rare event that there is a safety issue that affects the whole shelter. Shelters should always cl honor clients' confidentiality to the greatest extent possible, um, which again is often really difficult in a shelter environment. Um, but things like discussing clients' information with another client is not only a violation of confidentiality, but an invasion of privacy and a violation of ethics. Um, so make sure that we're not discussing the matters and the private information and the private experience of one client with another. And make sure that if you're discussing a client with other staff members and colleagues, you're having that discussion in a place that is private and where you can't be overheard. That when you are discussing sensitive topics with a resident, um, with a survivor, that again, you're doing it in places that are private and secure and cannot be overheard. Um, <clears throat> and also for medication um, purposes and, and for the purposes of valuables, agencies should provide a locked box or um, a locker or a locking cabinet for each adult resident. Um, and residents should be solely responsible for accessing that space. Um, if residents are the only ones responsible for accessing their locked space, um, this prevents staff from being seen as control controlling or dispensing medication. Um, and so it protects staff from that issue. Um, staff should never open or search this space while resident is in shelter. Staying away from residents' locked space also helps avoid accusations of theft um, made by clients towards staff or other residents and gives survivors a sense of autonomy and security. Okay, so making sure that you're thinking about storage space, private areas, and that you're considering how um, the ways in which clients are going to feel safe and secure um, within shelter. And so the other piece of this, so you, we've talked about physical safety, physical environment, and now we're going to talk a little bit about emotional safety and emotional environment. And the key to this, the key to understanding emotional safety is that there is a difference between being safe and feeling like you are safe. So residents may technically be safe, when they are in a shelter environment, but residents may or may not feel safe in that environment. They may or may not feel protected. They may or may not feel secure in a shelter. So emotional safety is all about how do we make sure that not only are res 
our residents physically safe, but that they feel safe and secure when they're in this space, right? So <clears throat> emotional safety is imperative so that survivors can feel more secure and comfortable and live in an, an environment where their worth is acknowledged and where they feel protected, comforted, and listened to, where they feel like their voices are being heard, where they feel like they are not being controlled um, or punished, right? The concept of emotional safety is an important aspect of serving survivors of trauma, but survivors may not use those words, right? Emotional safety is not a common concept that we just talk about in our day-to-day -day lives. So don't expect survivors to communicate in that way. Um, they may use different words. They may not have the, you know, they may not feel like they're safe enough or secure enough to even communicate when they feel safe or unsafe. So as advocates, we need to build the skills to hear the nonverbal things that survivors are telling us about their emotional safety. So think about body language. Think about interactions. Think about tones of voice. Think about where survivors are staying when they're in shelter. Are they locking themselves in their rooms? Are they refusing to come out and interact? Or do they feel safe enough to be in community spaces, to be, you know, talking and interacting with staff and other residents? Um, each survivor has their own communication needs related to physical and emotional safety. Some survivors may find it reassuring to have clear directions from a staff member with ex authority and expertise. Some may need safe spaces to vent their feelings and may just want to have their emotions validated. Others may seek a quiet space that allows them to de-stress and recharge by themselves without having to interact with others. Um, an important aspect of helping survivors feel in control is ensuring that they can ask for what they need and express opinions even if they are different than what other survivors are doing or seeking. Right? So everyone is different. And you may have some survivors who want to go to a staff member and want to hear, you know, this is the process, this is what we're doing, concrete action and reflection. You may have some survivors who just want to vent, right? Who just want to vent in private and feel like somebody is validating my emotions. And you may have survivors who don't want to, you know, when they're stressed out, what makes them feel better is having that time and space to be alone and to reflect and recharge, okay? So every survivor needs different things and making sure that they understand that regardless of the way that they express their stress or express their anxiety, um, that they can come to staff members um, for the things that they need, okay? So that's a big part of emotional safety. The other piece is trust and transparency. These are key elements in creating an emotionally and physically safe environment. This includes ensuring that expectations and intentions for shelter living and access to services are clear, that staff are being open, that staff are being honest, and telling clients what the expectations are in shelter, um, what they can expect from staff, the resources that are available to them, um, and again, being honest about shelter living, that we're clear and upfront with clients. Um, shelters should provide clear and simple information about plans and expectations. An example of that is um, publicly sharing the schedule of upcoming classes and events that will take place in shelter. Anything from support group meetings to movie nights to workshops, parenting classes, all of those things. 
sharing this schedule at the same time each week, sharing the schedule in a location that is open and accessible to all residents. For example, if you have it posted in large print on a bulletin board, um, in a common space like the shelter kitchen or living room. This can help residents feel comfortable and confident in the space. Remember that during the time that survivors are in shelter, the shelter is their home. And no one likes unplanned visitors, and no one likes unplanned events happening in their home that they don't know about ahead of time. Um, so having that, you know, having a calendar posted that says, you know, support group happens every Tuesday and Thursday. You know, we have a movie night scheduled for this Friday. Um, there's a parenting class that's happening every morning this week. So that residents know when are people going to be in, shelter, in the shelter. You know, when are things happening in the building? Um, when are visitors going to be here? Um, being transparent about this. Um, and also make sure that you're getting opinions and comments and observations from, from residents about their experience in shelter. So when, you know, you should be seeking feedback from every client you serve. So when someone comes through shelter, when they, you know, when they leave into transitional housing or an apartment or whatever it is, you should be seeking feedback from them about their experience in shelter. What worked? What didn't work? What can be changed? You know, what suggestions do you have? Um, and make sure that you're creating an open dialogue um, and responding to issues as they arise, right? Um, you may notice a shift in energy within the shelter when new residents enter or when other residents leave. Um, you may have a survivor raise concerns about the shelter environment or about an interaction with another resident or about staff behavior. Um, all of these things are opportunities for staff to respond respectfully to be honest and open, um, to address the concerns, which includes naming what's happening, not minimizing it, not sweeping it under the rug, um, and being open and willing to working together with residents to discuss what's working, what's not, and how things can get better. Also, when we're talking about emotional safety and security, we want to be thinking about the culture. Is the agency physically accessible to everyone, including those people with mobility issues? Uh, again, and this is, you know, this is a review, but are your, is your decor, are your reading materials, are your pamphlets or whatever, um, does it reflect the diversity of the people being served? You know, if you have a lot of Spanish speakers who come through your shelter, but none of your books, none of your posters, none of your materials are translated into Spanish, then you're not um, creating that welcoming environment. Um, if you're asking questions about culture or ethnicity or uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, primary language, if you're asking that question to one person, you should be asking that question to every person who seeks out your services, right? Don't single any one person out to ask these kinds of questions. Ask these questions to everyone and make sure that people know that they can decide whether or not they respond to the questions and they can decide how they respond to the questions. Um, Training staff members to ask questions in ways that are inclusive, in ways that are not stigmatizing, in ways that reflect um, culture. And so we're being, <clears throat> excuse me, so that we're being open, so that we're being respectful, so that we're being safe. Um,
sorry, I had a little bit of a crazy tech issue, but here we are. Okay, so here are a couple of resources um, for agency assessments and tools that are available to help the organization. If you're thinking about evaluating your physical environment, um, I will be sending out um, this resource to you. I'll send you an email that includes the PowerPoint, that includes these resources, and that also includes um, your certificate of attendance. So all of that will be sent out, emailed out to you this afternoon. Um, are there any questions or concerns about the things that we've gone over today? I am going to stay on the line uh, for another minute or two so that if, if anyone does have questions or concerns um, that you all can type it in the chat box and I am here to respond. Um, otherwise, as I said, I will be sending out all of this information um, and make sure that you have it and we will see you next time. Thank you so much for attending this morning. Here's a question, can you talk more about searching clients and their privacy? Um, <clears throat> what I will just say is this, that it is not at all, um, it's not a best practice to search clients. What we really want is to make sure um, that we are giving clients a safe, open space. And if we are searching them, if we're searching their personal items, if we're searching their rooms, um, regularly, this is not creating a safe space. So what we want to do, um, you know, because every shelter has issues sometimes with weapons and sometimes with drugs in rooms, so what we want to do is be really open up front when clients are, you know, when you're doing your intake session in shelter about what the rules are around drugs, about what the rules are around weapons, um, and give them the opportunity to disclose at that time um, and to get rid of drugs and to get rid of we weapons. If, you know, if you are, if there is an incident that happens that, you know, demonstrates or leads you to believe that there is a clear and present danger, um, then that's one thing, and that may, you know, present an opportunity where searching might be necessary, but in the regular course of action to search um, residents' rooms just as a matter of procedure is, you know, is a pretty severe violation of privacy um, and security and really is a way that, you um, that makes residents feel unsafe and makes residents feel um, as if they are being controlled um, in a way that reflects the power and control tactics that their abusers may have used. So that's really why we want to steer away from that. Perfect. All right. Um, any other questions or concerns? And again, uh, you know, my email is up on screen if you have questions that you would like to talk about after the webinar um, or if issues come up that you want to talk to me about um, in greater detail, I am happy to have those conversations with you and talk to you in more detail about issues as they arise. All right, it looks like we are out of questions, so I am going to go ahead and sign off. Again, please feel free to email me if you have any other questions or concerns, and be looking for an email um, including resources to out later this afternoon. Thank you all for being here this morning.